It's been a long journey to get to this point, several years in fact, but the Nintendo Switch finally has a great Pokemon game. And I guess uh, PC does as well. But we're going to focus on the Nintendo Switch version of this game. It's a pretty big deal, if you ask me. I'm talking, of course, about Monster Hunter Stories 2 Wings of Ruin. I know I'm a bit late to the party on this. I'll start off by saying uh, I've been slacking in general on gaming and YouTube, clearly, uh, if you're paying attention to my level of uploads lately. Uh, but we're going to start getting back into the groove of things here. Uh, I know there's also other games that have come out recently that some of you may also want to hear my thoughts on. And yeah, there's more coming in terms of games you may think I wasn't going to cover. And I definitely wanted to make sure I talked about Monster Hunter Stories 2 because uh, I think with the success of Rise, there are a lot of people that are, one, getting into the Monster Hunter series now themselves that would like to spend more time in this world, maybe have a more story-driven adventure that gives you more lore, as well as two perhaps longtime fans of the core games that may not have checked out the original Monster Hunter stories on 3DS and are on the fence as to whether or not this game is for them. And of course, thirdly, as I alluded to at the beginning, there are quite a few similarities between this game and a fairly popular RPG series that I, I just can't resist putting on blast. So, of course, I've got to address that. Speaking of, let's start with the visuals of this game. The Monster Hunter Stories titles take on a much more cartoony anime art style compared to the mainline games. If you played the original on 3DS, you're just cranking that style up to the next level, going bigger and obviously more HD. There are pretty large, diverse biomes to be explored, as you'd expect from the Monster Hunter series, that are filled with monsters roaming around for you to fight. Uh, later in the game, you actually get the ability to fly, and I enjoy just randomly flying around the map, taking in the sights and that. Like, I really feel like this is a gorgeous game. Frame rate is pretty solid as usual with Switch games. I wish it was higher, but it gets the job done. I mostly only notice some judder when flying as the game tries to keep loading the environment and the monsters in that end. And there's a little bit of pop in in those instances too, but nothing too egregious. And again, with how good the game looks, the frame rate holds up well. I also think it's worth noting there are some wonderfully animated cutscenes that really help keep you engaged with the story. Obviously, with the series being called Monster Hunter Stories, there is more emphasis on the story aspect, which let's move on to that. In terms of the story, there's always one big question in a game that is a sequel. Do I have to play the previous game to enjoy the story of this game? You definitely don't need to while this game does take place after the first game, you're a new character in that, but there are a lot of elements, I will say, tied to the first. It's one of those instances where if you haven't played the first game, you'll be dealing with a lot of, oh, hey, it's that guy. Oh, remember this thing that happened? And you're just going to be sitting there totally clueless. But the broader story is mostly self-contained. So it is an instance where I would recommend that you play the first game if you're able to. Uh, but if you can't, you just don't want to, you will still be able to enjoy this game. But yeah, you play as a monster... Rider. Riders are at least painted as more friendly versions of uh, the hunters that you'd be familiar with in the core games. Uh, I honestly find this kind of funny. Uh, the riders are given this more worldly kind of portrayal. They're friends to the monsters, right? But at the end of the day, both in these games as riders and in the core series as hunters, you're killing the shit out of monsters by the dozens. Now you're just doing it with your own monsters by your side. Well, not exactly monsters, right? Because they're called monsties. And I do have to go on a little bit of a rant here. Yeah, again, monsties are what your pet monsters are called. That's where all the characters refer to them as. And yeah, I remember seeing this like in the first game, the guy talking to you at the beginning and he's like, Oh, monsty, it's a combination of monster and bestie. Isn't that great? And I was just like, no, not really. I find it so stupid, just a terrible name, very cringe. And the reason it's kind of a big deal is you hear it all the time. So especially in like more serious cutscenes, 
when a character uses the term monsty, it just, it takes me out of it. Again, I, I cringe, like, every time. Do you hope to control this Rathalos' power? Yeah. I mean, I guess so. I see. This monsty. That's really, like, my main complaint with this series. It does, I just find that term so irritating. And I get that it does have a more cute anime style and vibe compared to the mainline core games, but... Yeah, the Monsi thing, ah, it's just, it's dumb. Anyway, you're a rider, someone who befriends, raises, tames monsters, and you come upon this baby Rathalos that has some very unique wings, uh, wings that don't work very well, and it turns out it's very likely these may be the legendary Wings of Ruin that are said to be part of a monster that will bring chaos and destruction to the world, you know how that sort of stuff goes. And at the same time, these pits start popping up around the world that are enraging monsters in the area, creating a threat to nearby villages. So you venture out and are trying to find out why these pits are popping up. Obviously, you want to stop them, as well as find out more about Ratha and his connection to all this. I personally like the story of this, both of these games, in fact. I can't get enough of cute little creature characters in anything, whether it be games, movies, TV, whatever. It's an easy mode way to pull you in to make you care about characters, right? Especially like when you first get your Ratha and he's just this like little baby boy, it's like, must protect. And as I mentioned earlier, you have some phenomenally animated cutscenes that don't hurt when you're trying to stay engaged either. Gameplay-wise, this is a combination of a turn-based RPG. Again, you have sort of the Pokemon thing going on with capturing and training monsters. Uh, actually, you don't really capture the monsters. You find nests in dens that are like dungeons in the game and you search through them and can pick up an egg and then take it with you back to your village where you can hatch it. Then you got a new monsty. But yeah, again, while the combat is turn-based, you've actually got a lot of elements of the core games here, like being able to target and break monster parts. This can help you down the monsters as well as, you know, a monster may have a specific special move it uses with like its tail, so you want to target the tail so it can stop using that move. Monsters have different attack types and weaknesses, so you need to arm yourself accordingly, just like in Monster Hunter. And when you kill monsters, they drop materials that you use to craft armor and weapons. You also now have these monsties fighting alongside you, and so you want to have a diverse team with you at all times to be ready for any situation. Monsters also have different skills that can help you explore the environment. Like I mentioned, there's flying ones earlier, but some can like jump across wide gaps, dig tunnels to otherwise unreachable locations, so you want not just different types of monsters for fights, but ones with different abilities so you can, you know, get treasures and stuff like that that are hidden in the environment. When leveling up monsters, you also get these uh, trait slots that can beef up their stats, and you can take traits from one monster and give them to another, but this forces you to release the original monster that you're taking the trait from, so this gives you a good reason to collect a lot of monsters to power up your main ones. I will say prepping for fights can be kind of annoying because unlike the mainline Monster Hunter games, a lot of the time you don't know what monster you're about to fight, like you're just moving to the next point in the story and oh whoa a new random monster appears and the fight starts. Uh, luckily you can change monsters during fights as well as your weapons and these things don't even like cost a turn or anything. So for the most part, you just have to have the right stuff on your person, but still like having the wrong type of armor on can make for a bad time in some of those fights. But I also get that with the game being more story driven, you want those elements of surprise. You don't just want to like know everything that's coming for you, but fights can go on for like 20, 30 turns even. And if you have like an armor type that's weak against the monster you're fighting, that can really screw you up but I do enjoy the combat. You've got sort of a rock, paper, scissors deal with power, speed, and technical attacks. Speed beats power, power beats technical, etc. Opponents attack each other, the one with the winning type will hit. Some moves do ignore this though, and as you fight monsters, you're gonna sort of learn their attack patterns, like what type of moves they do when they're in like their normal state versus like enraged and so on. And as you build up kinship with your monsters throughout a fight, you can perform stronger moves, including devastating, over-the-top special attacks. That's key in JRPGs, right? You want to see some bonkers ultimate attacks, and they are plentiful here. 
You can also time like your special attack with other characters that are in your party to perform even more obnoxious moves. As yeah, you'll meet characters throughout the game that will join you periodically. These can be other riders as well as hunters. Uh, hunters don't have their own monsters, but they tend to do more damaging attacks. And you also fight, obviously, random monsters in the wild, but from time to time, other riders as well, which do require a different approach to fight. This game took me about 30 hours to beat. That's going to vary a lot by player on how much you want to do uh, side stuff, as well as go after like the rarer monsters in that. You know, you've got like rarer dungeon types that when you get to the end to the monster eggs, you can get like a rarer egg. So you can put a lot more time into the game. That way there are challenges to beat for different rewards, uh, as well as a post game where you can tackle even tougher fights. And there's even online multiplayer. You can battle cooperatively or against other players for other various rewards. So I think this is a beautiful, engaging game with a good amount of content that I highly recommend to both old and newcomers to this franchise, as well as even like an entry point, I think, for newcomers who may be intimidated or turned off a bit by the core games. Uh, I know the core Monster Hunter games kind of have this more hardcore reputation, so if you're someone who may be interested in getting into the world of Monster Hunter with something that's a bit slower paced, more story driven, this should be right up your alley. Which brings me of course to my initial taunt to the king of the monster collecting and battling genre, Pokemon. This game is just another example of the quality that we should be seeing from that franchise. Sure, a lot of the gameplay is different it's not just like Pokemon, but it's close enough. And again, we're talking about a game that's only going to sell a fraction of the amount of copies. I think they were just celebrating how it was a big deal that they already cracked like a million sales for this game. Where, you know, Pokemon Sword and Shield sold, what, like 20 million? This isn't going to hit anywhere near those numbers. And I'll say the story elements, cutscenes in that really stood out here to me. Like, why aren't we getting this level of quality from Pokemon? I mean, you contrast this with like the infamous turning animations in the uh, cutscenes in Pokemon. Like you could easily have something this interesting and engaging in the Pokemon universe, but nope. And we always, I know, harp on like the visuals in that in Pokemon, but I'd say, you know, gameplay wise, like the flying in this game that I thought was so fun, you know, just mounting up on these different monsters and getting to like fly over all these environments. Why am I not doing this on like an Arcticuno or something in the Pokemon games? Games that again sell like 20 million copies. So money and resources aren't the problem. So what's the reason? Like do you think is your argument that you think people wouldn't enjoy flying around a big open Pokemon environment? And you defenders want to get mad at people like me where they say they're being cheap, they're being lazy. So then if they're not being cheap and lazy, what's the reason? More immersive storytelling? Elements like flying around bigger, wider open environments is your argument that people wouldn't like these things? Completely ridiculous. As the title of this video implies, I think this is another company that should totally get a crack at doing something with the Pokemon franchise. I mean, you look at how amazing of a job Bandai Namco did with a new Pokemon Snap, and I'm just sitting here like, please give me more games in the Pokemon universe that are made by people who actually care, who are actually going to try. And especially at a time where it's not just like there's these minimal improvements happening in the mainline Pokemon games, the games that are being made by Game Freak. But this franchise is being pimped out all over the place. Uh, this comes at a time where you've got something like Pokemon Unite, that pay to win garbage. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go more into that game here, but uh, you've totally lost any sense of like protecting the IP. You know, that's long been... Nintendo's excuse for many franchises like, oh, we have to maintain a certain level of quality. That's not the case for the Pokemon franchise with like dozens of mobile cash grabs. Like it's clear you don't give a shit what's going on with the franchise. So again, why not give more actual competent studios a crack at it? I think Capcom, this team, this game proves that if they got a chance with the Pokemon IP, they'd at least blow away everything that Game Freak's done in the last, I don't know, decade. Anyway, I'm going to cut the video off here before this turns into a rant. Again, I very much recommend Monster Hunter Stories 2 to both JRPG and Monster Hunter fans. Also, like I said, maybe someone who's been looking for an entry point into the Monster Hunter series with all its popularity lately, but 
not really feeling the like the gameplay they see in the mainline games. Once more, you'd like something a bit slower paced and more story based. I think the game's super fun, and it's one of the better looking Switch games in my opinion. Capcom continues to kill it. They're a big reason, I'd say, right now why Nintendo, I think, is having a pretty strong 2021. I mean, Monster Hunter Rise and now Monster Hunter Stories 2 are two awesome games that Capcom has put out in just a few months' time, which is why, again, I'd also love to see them get their hands on the Pokemon franchise at some point. Anyway, with that, this video's a wrap. Let me know your thoughts on Monster Hunter Stories 2 in the comments. Are you currently playing the game? Are you interested in picking it up? And would you like to see Capcom get a shot at the Pokemon franchise? As always, I'm the shy guy, Johnny Zakari, and thanks for watching.